Good morning. Today we celebrate the Feast of the Blessed Trinity. And again, when Jesus tells us, or he tells his apostles, that I have much more to tell you, but you cannot bear it now. One of the things, of course, he was talking about is the Trinity. Huh? Because when Jesus was around, they didn't all believe in one God and three divine persons, right? Some people didn't even know Jesus was God. You know, the church got insight into that way after the resurrection when they developed the whole doctrine of what Trinity is. The God is one God in three divine persons. And it comes to us from the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit himself. Now, of course, the Scriptures hint to it. The Scriptures say, you know, go and baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and we will come and live within you and all these things there. But the doctrine of the Trinity was something that was developed later. You know, there was some of the earliest uh, heresies, of course, in the church was that Jesus only appeared to be a man, he wasn't truly man, or that he appeared, you know, he was the son of God, but he wasn't God. And they would fight over these things for a long time before we got to this is who God is. One God, three divine persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Father, the Father is not the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is not the Son. Three persons, but one God. And so, again, the way I've explained it and shown it throughout the years is, you know, Patrick held up a nice, what was that he held up? Shamrock, yeah. One shamrock, three parts. I've always liked the image of the uh, a candle, a flame of a candle. And if you look at the flame, there is one flame, but it has three parts. It has a white part, it has a clear part, and it has a blue part. Right? But it's one flame and three parts. But the reality, however we explain it, what we do know about the Trinity is the Trinity has always been a community of love. This community of love. You know, again, as I was uh, uh, preaching the book we started last week in the Lord's Prayer, we began with our. And we talk about, you know, God before we were ever created, before any time. And again, you want to blow your mind, just try to think of no beginning. You know, try to think just for a moment. Something had no beginning. Because every time we look at anything, we try to find where to come from, where it come from. Well, something always existed, had no beginning. When you try to get your mind around that, your mind goes, Pleh! It spits it out. We cannot even begin to comprehend something always existed. And so this something that always existed, we call Almighty God. And so sometimes we think, oh, God must have been lonely, always existing, always existing, always existing. So he decided to create us to have some people around to fool around with, right? No, God, though he has always existed, has never been alone. God has always been a community of persons. The Father's always loved the Son, the Son's always loved the Father, and their love is so real, it's the Holy Spirit. And so what happens is when he creates us, what we're called to do is be like him. It's just that simple. And so that's why it's, you know, like often we pray the glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end, amen. Well, what does it mean to give God glory? It's more than just a prayer. It's something that we live. And what we live, the way we give God glory is we live in community of love, that we become like God on earth. The God of love creates people to love. And what happens is we need to learn that. Again, and Pope Francis, I mean, I can't stop talking about him. Everywhere I go, I talk about, there's always Pope Francis. I was at Notre Dame yesterday speaking and talking about confession. I said, listen, Pope Francis is kicking me in the stomach and he better be kicking you in the stomach about the way we're growing. One of the things, you know, he talked about last week was when people go to confession to him, he would sit there and often ask them as people came in for confession, did you give some money to the poor that were waiting at the door today? And a lot of people, of course, would say no. Some of them would say, well, of course. And so he'd say, oh, well, when you gave them money, did you stop and did you look into their eyes? Oh, no. So what God's calling us to is not only we need to take care of the poor, huh? which again, we all make excuses why we don't, but anyway, that we actually stop and look in their eyes, right? Again, the other day I was up, 
and I was up at Walmart. You know, I, go, my, I live at either a Lowe's or a Home Depot every day. I go there for something. But anyway, I had to go to Walmart to get carrots for my dogs. They eat carrots, you know. And as I was coming out, there was a van there, and it says, you know, broke down. I saw it as I was coming, and I go, oh, I hope they're not there when I come out. So they were there when I came out, and they had a big sign, we need some help, da, da, da. And so it was, uh, <laughs> I thought, okay, got to live it, got to live it, got to live it, got to live it. So I pull up next to them, and I turn down the window. Father, can you help? Sure, gave him 20 bucks. And then I sat there and I thought, the Holy Father says you got to look them in the eye, which means you got to be in relationship with them, which means you got to treat them as persons. So I sat there and I went down to look them in the eye, and it was very uncomfortable for me. Very uncomfortable. Because now I just wanted to go do things, and God's saying, I want you to stop your life, and I want you to be in a relationship with somebody you don't know. Who's someone who can use you, someone who can take advantage of you, do it. Okay. Did it. Liked it? Yeah. Didn't think I would. But the reality is, if we're going to follow the God of love, then every single person, every single person, every single person that he created was created in his image. Every single person we are called to look at and we are called to see them in the image of God. We are called to do that. People we agree with, people we don't agree with, people we like, people we don't like, people that hate us, people that love us. That the God of love calls us to be like him. That is how we give glory to God. Huh? When we say glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. But again, too often we think that to honor and to worship God, I go into my little world, I pray in my little way, and I focus on me and Jesus. But that's never been what the Trinity's been about. The Trinity has never been about itself. The Trinity has always been outpouring to others. And so the call for us, if we're going to imitate the Trinity, is that we go and we pour out our life for others. We stop. We recognize people. We look at people. We take time with people. Again, will this be easy? No. 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 (laughs) Well, for some of you, you might do it automatically. I do not. I am a very imperfect, and I'm a priest, right? This is supposed to be what we do naturally. It isn't. Again, it isn't just me. When I was in Rome, I would walk by bishops, cardinals, priests, seminarians, nuns. They wouldn't even acknowledge your presence. Huh? I told you before, once I was walking down, I said, good morning, gentlemen, to a bunch of seminarians. Didn't even say hello to Father, which isn't good. Because as I'm walking by and I'm saying, good morning, gentlemen, they would keep walking by. And one morning I said, gentlemen, come here. You will acknowledge that I am a living human being, as I said to them before I told you. And they says, Father, you scare us. Good. (laughs) That's the point. And when I says, when you become bishop, I better scare you some more. But the reality is that when we are church, sometimes we think we just got to focus on ourselves and our relationship and keeping ourselves together. But that is not what God's calling us to. So today, as we focus on the Trinity, God wants us to be like him, a community of love, a community that stops and loves people, whether we know them, whether we don't. And again, we're not all going to change instantly. I'm not going to change instantly, and neither are you. But we need to get on the road. We need to say, this is where God's calling me. It's not where I'm comfortable going, but this is what God wants of me, and I'm going to have to start walking that direction. So today, let's make it that we're going to be like our God, because he wants us to, and we're going to start stopping, noticing people, loving people, entering in a relationship with people, whether we feel like it or whether we don't. You got it? Get it? Going to do it? May it you know his love today and forever. Amen. Let us now stand and let us profess our faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven. 
Good morning. Today we celebrate the Feast of Corpus Christi, or the Most Holy Body and Blood of Jesus. Huh? And again, before we jump right into the homily to make clear what we believe, huh? I was, one of my friends just came up from Florida and he was there at the last Mass and we're talking now. This man has written many books. He's very solid Catholic. He has a great family. And he was telling me about his uh, son. And his son just was coming back to the faith. He's in his 40s and grew up in this very, very, very solid Catholic group. And he's joined this other church in a particular place. And he says, he called up his dad and he goes, you know, dad, I just found out about this great thing. And his father said, what is it? He said, about transubstantiation. And his father goes, oh, you just heard about that now? You know, and he was brought up in a faith. And so sometimes we don't get it. Transubstantiation by the the lack of response to what I just said. (laughs) Most of you don't know what it is either. Transubstantiation is what we believe, that the bread and wine become the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ and stays that way. So what we believe about today is that the bread here that we're going to put our hands over in a moment will become Almighty God. In the tabernacle, of course, is Almighty God. Now, some people sit there and think, well, I don't believe that. Well, you need to believe it because if you don't believe it, you call Jesus Christ a liar. He said, this is my body. He said, this is my blood. He says, if you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will live forever. Everybody in the early church believed it. Paul talks about it in the second reading. I'm handing on to you what was handed on to me. The first thing Jesus Christ ever did after the resurrection was on the road to Emmaus. He sat down with them. He broke open the bread and he vanished from their sight to show them that the way Christ is present is in the Eucharist. Huh? Martin Luther, the first Protestant, believed that. The church is as old as we are. The Orthodox Church, they believe in a real presence. If the real presence isn't real, then you can take the Bible and throw it in the toilet. Because the same church that said way before 390 AD when they said that these uh, 27 books are the Holy Word of God, the same church said that the bread and wine becomes the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ, and the early church are willing to die for it. So if you don't believe in the Eucharist, you can't believe in the Word of God because it was the same church that said both. You got that? We got to be consistent in what we believe. So what we believe and what we celebrate today is the bread and wine become the body, blood of our God. And he humbles himself before us. And when we listen today in the gospel, when Jesus feeds us with himself, we're always satisfied. His feeding us brings us healing. Because remember, it sat there and says in the beginning of the gospel that many who were needed, they were cured. And then he fed them. That Jesus loves to take care of us. And he loves to satisfy us. And yet we go around looking for other things to satisfy us. Huh? We think it'll be money. We think it'll be sex. We think it'll be uh, alcohol. We think it'll be other people. And we're constantly trying to fill up inside. And then we find out that nothing satisfies us. And we go again and again. And we have to do it again and again and again. And nothing satisfies us. And nothing ever will. Until we come to Jesus. And he will feed us with himself. He'll give us an abundance, as today we hear in the gospel, and then he will satisfy us. So first of all, we have to stop looking everywhere else to be satisfied and come to Jesus. But when we come to Jesus, the first reading today huh, was about what? Do you remember? Melchizedek. Now, Melchizedek, that's the first of our wooden carvings in the back. Now, you notice, of course, everyone on this back altar, it all has to do with Eucharist. And each one of the things that represents Christ is in gold. So Melchizedek is in gold, Jesus is in gold, Jesus is in gold. And the Lamb, of course, is in gold. They all represent Eucharist. They all represent the Christ. Now, when it talks about Melchizedek today, Abraham's coming to Melchizedek. Now, and what does Abraham do? After Melchizedek does the bread and wine, then it says uh, Abraham gave him what? A tenth of all he had. All he had. Now, I'm not going to talk about tithing today. Aren't you excited? Thank you, Father. Anyway, but I'm going to talk about more than tithing. When God satisfies us and he gives us himself, we must give him everything. Not part of everything. 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 Huh? Again, we talk about tithing and, oh, I have to give 10% of my income to God. 
Yep, that's very nice. And everybody needs to do it. But that ain't the way the early church did it. The early church, when you came to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, what did you have to come and bring before the apostles? Everything. If you held anything back, you know, remember Peter, that they were bringing, this husband and wife were bringing in, and they said, oh, this is, and they brought all their lands and everything and laid them before the feet of Peter. And Peter said, is that everything? And the guy says, oh, yeah, that's everything. And he says, your lie will just cost you your life. And the guy drops dead right there. And then the woman comes in, the bride, the wife, and says, did you give everything? Yeah, boom, died. In the early church, if we were to follow Christ as the early church did, they had to give everything, holding nothing back. So what happened was, as time went on, we says, well, how about I give 10%? Ah, except for Catholics, they don't even believe in that, you know, because like, oh, I have to take care of myself first. But don't you get it? When you and I come to God and he satisfies us, he asks us for something in return, in love. So do you and I ever want to be known as a taker? You know, we come before God, gimme, gimme, gimme. I want, I want, I want. What are you going to do for me this week, Jesus? I'm going to feed you my own body and blood. Is that all? Yeah, it'll cost me everything. What will it cost you to come to Mass today? What it must cost us if we're going to follow Jesus, really follow him, is it must cost us everything. If not, we're just giving him, having him come to use him. Take, take, take. I need, I need, I need. I want, I want, I want. But today, Abraham gave back to Melchizedek. So what God wants from you and I is for us to give back to him. And so the first thing he wants is everything. He doesn't want part of you. He doesn't want you to come for once a week and say, here, I'm giving you 45 minutes to an hour. Father Larry's here. I'm going to give you an hour and 10 minutes this week. Okay? And so look at me. That's it. Really? But Lord, I want you to bless me. I want you to take care of my family. I want you to make sure I have enough money. I want you to do this. I want you to do that. I want you to do that. And he goes, okay, I'll satisfy you. But is that all you're here for is to use me? Or are you here because you love me? And if you love me, are you going to show you love me? What are you going to give me? Because love is always about giving and receiving, huh? And if I say I love you, I'm going to give my life for you. Jesus proves it today with the Eucharist. He loves you and he gives his life for you. So if you're going to look at him today and say, and Jesus, I love you. It's about love, Jesus, I love you. And to prove, Jesus, I love you, I'm going to do as you've done for me. I give you my life. And the way you and I prove that we give our life to Jesus is we give him time, right? You can't sit there and say to your wife or your husband, you know, I love you. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you 45 minutes to an hour a week. Aren't you excited? You know, what would your spouse do if, they, if you sat there and says, you know, I really love you, sweetheart. And to do that, I'm going to, what is the minimum I have to do to prove I love you? What's the minimum, honey? Is the minimum I have to be with you for 45 minutes to an hour a week? Okay, I'll give you the minimum. There you go. How many of you would like that if your spouse always looked at you and say, what's the minimum, the very minimum I got to do to prove to you I love you. You would not stay married to anybody if they came to you every week and they says, okay, what's the minimum I have to do for you this week? Okay, I'll do it. And then I'm on my way. And yet often, that's what we do with Jesus. Jesus, what's the minimum I have to do not to go to hell? Jesus, what's the minimum I have to do to be one of your disciples? That isn't about love. It's about looking at us and what we can minimally give someone so we get saved. What he wants from you and me is everything. And so we prove that by giving him time each day, not part of our time. Every day we not fit God into our life. We build our day around God. If we can, we spend time in front of the Blessed Sacrament. Because if I love him, to give him an extra hour a week is the easiest thing I could ever do in my life. Because if I love him, I want to be with him. If I don't love him, I want to give him the minimum I can to get saved. Today, as we celebrate the feast of Corpus Christi, and he gives everything for love of you and me, let's respond and let's give everything for love of him. And let's prove it by giving him our time each day.
May you know his love today and forever. Amen. Let us stand and let us profess our faith. You'll need your little cards. I believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and of earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation he came down from heaven. And by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, was suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken to the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and a life in the world to come. Amen. Believing in this God who would rather die than live without any of us, let's now turn to him and give to him these our needs and our petitions. Good morning. Happy Father's Day to you fathers out there, the ones who are around, the fathers. Today, as we focus on the, the Word of God, <laughs> my light's out, as we focus on God's Holy Word, there's two things we're going to focus on, the second reading and the Gospel. And we're just going to focus on love and two different parts of love. As you have been with me now, most of you, for at least, this will be in July, I'll be beginning my 11th year here, when we, my favorite verse of the Bible that'll be on my gravestone when I drop dead at 120, because the good die young, that it'll be Galatians, explain it to the person next to you, it'll be Galatians chapter 2, verse 19 and 20. I have been crucified with Christ. So the life I live now is no longer my own. Jesus Christ lives inside of me. I still live my human life, yes, but it's a life of faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. So this is where it begins, that we're loved by Christ so much that he gave his life for us. And so that's not even a question, except for most people most people in our churches, I was in Seattle yesterday and gave three talks yesterday morning and a, a talk the night before to the a men's conference yesterday, uh, yesterday. And I met with a couple on the Marion over there. And then I uh, met with, uh, it was funny on the way back on the, on the plane, I met with a guy who hadn't been to church in 15 years. And so he was a younger guy. And so Usually you talk for a few minutes and then you go to sleep, or I normally do. For, but for three and a half hours, we talked about the faith. And the biggest thing I kept saying to him, and I said to the men, and I've said to you many times, that most people don't get it. That what this faith is about is being loved by God. That's what it's about. That this God, and we're reminded of it in every Catholic church throughout the world, when you come into a Catholic church, most Catholic churches that are in line with Rome have a crucifix to be seen. And the reason we hold up a crucifix isn't to sit there and to, you know, say, you know, and people come in and say, Jesus is alive, why do you people keep him on a cross? Oh, stop it. Christ is very much alive. He's resurrected. This is to remind us how much we're loved. 
when Paul says, I have been crucified with him. So it sits there and talks about he crude loved me and gave his life for me. That's what it's about. And so then what the crucifix is about is to say, listen, now love him the way he loved you. And see, this is where the, the, the second part comes in with the gospel. That this woman who is a sinner who came before and then Jesus tells the parable and he says, who is forgiven? You know, who loved the most? The one who is forgiven more. And he said, you see this woman? She has been given, forgiven a lot because she loved a lot. That's the question for all of us. Are we, first of all, aware of the love of God? Do we spend time in the love of God each day? Do we ground ourselves? If I was to ask you, what is your life grounded on? Is it money? Is it how you feel today? Is it how people treat you today? Is it, you know, whatever? Or are you grounded? Is the ground of your being Jesus who loved you and gave his life for you. Is this the thing that changes everything else? And the the way we find out that's real is, as I was talking about these poor men yesterday, I really just let them have it. I said, listen, the way you can tell that you're loved by God and you finally get it is when you're more concerned about other people. I says, until we get the people that are coming to church and get over themselves and think, I'm here so God can just love me and take care of me, they don't get it. They're takers, and takers have nothing to do with God. If the, you know, we're all called to be ministers. This isn't just my job and the 10 people would get up and do things. Everyone here is called to minister, or you're not a follower, you're a taker, huh? And so the way we come to find out I am loved by God is that I become more concerned about others because I'm not always trying to fill that black hole inside of me. So I don't expect everyone just to take care of me. That when I come and I'm grounded, I am loved by the Father, then I can love other people. And my life is, shows that by every day ministering to others. That's what it is. If I am not grounded in love, I only look for people to minister to me, to take care of me, to fill my need, to entertain me to make sure I get to go to Mass the way I like it, that the songs are the way I'm about. It's grounded on me instead of a life grounded on Him who loves me and gave His life for me. So the first question you and I got to ask is who have I grounded my life on? Am I grounded in the love of the Father, the love of Jesus, the love of the Spirit, And if I am, I can show that because now I'm more concerned about others. Now I'm ministering to others because my need is already taken. My need is already fulfilled. So again, I want you to ask the question of yourself honestly. Are you a minister of Christ? Are you a person who does things for other people every day? Are you a person who comes to church and this isn't your only following of Christ? This is the place where you learn, okay, how, do I, how am I going to love some more, right? And so we got to make sure that this is where we're grounded. We are loved by God. Now, then when this comes, it isn't about following the rules, as Paul's very clear in today in Galatians. And it isn't just about doing the right thing. What it's about is being in love with Jesus, right? Think about the woman who was willing when all the judgmental people were there, you know, it's like a lot of churches on Sunday and a person comes walking in and everybody knows they're a sinner. And they think, they wouldn't say it out loud because we're good people. What are they doing here? Huh? Instead of like, how can I help you? Come on in, come here, come here, come here. You know, again, I was talking about, uh, on the way I was over there and we were talking about how you can tell the people that know their love by if on Sunday... They come into church and someone is sitting in their pew. They're quite happy about it. And they think, oh, that's really good that that person took my place. And there's a book uh, Doug, uh, that Deacon Doug told us about. And I remember if I was reading this one thing. We're going to be doing a lot with this book here, just so you know. But there was a woman who came into Mass on Christmas. And she came into Mass Christmas Eve. 
This is a true story of what happened in the church in Baltimore. The church, of course, was packed. Huh? And this woman who came every week and her seat was taken because she came 10 minutes before at midnight at the, the uh, uh, vigil mass. And so she starts screaming in the church. I come here every week. This is my church. And you people just show up on Christmas. That's it. She takes her money. She rips up her envelopes. I will never come back to this church again. And walks out. Hmm. Were we, are we more concerned about someone who might have never been to our church to gladly give up my parking space where I always park? to gladly give up my seat, to gladly stand if I have to stand. Because this isn't about me. It's about me ministering to the one who loves me and gave his life for me, and for me to show that I love him, that I'm always going to be more concerned about others. It's just the way it has to happen. So I really, because we're going to be starting to deal with this a lot in the next months, huh? about how we as a church are going to have to become more concerned about others than about ourselves. That this isn't about us coming to Mass on Sunday. It's about us ministering and reaching out to the lost. Because that's what Jesus did. And that's what every one of us here, every single one of us, need to do. We must reach out to the lost. So again, go next door. We have our fellowship would never let a person come in and sit. Some people with their fellowship, they always sit with the same people because this is my little group of cliques that I love. And you'd never let another person into your little clique. Well, who do you love? That's not a follower of Jesus. A follower of Jesus, come here. I want you to sit with us. I don't know you. I know. Come. You'll get to know us. But we respond to God in love because he loves us. We base our life on the God who loved me and gave his life for me so that I, when I look at a crucifix, can love others and give my life for others. This is always the point. As I just preached these ten, these poor people who came every hour for the ten hours that I preached the Just Live It book, I spent ten hours on one prayer. And every single one of them, I kept saying, you do this, so you can take care of others. When you say our, it means you are part of a community. So that means you're never alone, first principle, but part of that principle is so you never let other people be alone. Father, the God of the universe is my dad, and I am always loved. So that's that mean that I must always love everybody else. That every part of the Lord's Prayer that you and I will say today has a part that we receive and a part it demands that we now give. So it's both. We just can't focus on, I am loved by God, oh my. It's I am loved by my Father, and now I'm called to love other people the same way. And if it kills me, now I'm finally a follower of Jesus Christ. Now I'm finally doing what he created me to do. So to follow him, is going to kill us. I have been crucified with Christ so that we no longer live. Jesus Christ lives inside of us who loved us and gave his life for us. You got it? You get it? You're going to do it? You can tell I'm tired. I got in late last night in Pittsburgh, so sorry. <laughs> Made sure you know his love today and forever. Amen. Let us stand and let us profess our faith. You'll need your card, most of you anyway. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. Good morning. Today is the Feast of the Epiphany, or Three Kings, or 
three wise men or the magi or whatever what you're going to say it. But as we sit there and reflect on it, we begin, they tell us how we're called to live, these three kings. And it starts by God's invitation. Here God gives a gift. He gives the gift of his only son. He has nothing else to give. He gives everything in that. And yet these three magi see this gift and they respond by bringing gifts. And so it needs to be the same with us. We need to be people that respond to the God of the universe by bringing him gifts. By bringing him something for what he's done for us. And again, I don't know if you know people that are always uh, gimme, gimme, gimme people. You have a friends, any friends like that? That they're always saying, hey, can you do this for me? Hey, can you help me? Hey, I need this. Hey, I need that. Oh my goodness, could you do that for me? And every time you see them, you know they're going to ask you to do something. So what do you learn to do? Run the other way. When they call you, you praise God every day that you have that caller ID so you can say, oh, it's them. Oh, I'm not home. You know, you know what those type friends are like. And everybody has them in their life. And there's all people, there's always all of us, we have people in our lives that we go, oh, I call them the black hole people. It's coming, gimme, gimme, gimme. Give nothing back, never give back. It's just gimme, gimme, gimme. They're this black hole that keep taking, taking, taking. And we run away from those people. And yet, so often we're those type people with God. Gimme, gimme, gimme. I want, I want. Can you do this? Can you do this? Can you do this? Oh, please bless me. Oh, help me not to have cancer. Oh, help me to not be, help me to be healthy. Oh, help me make money. Oh, God, get me this job. Oh, God, take care of me. Oh, God, give me peace. Gimme, 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 gimme. But the big difference, of course, is God doesn't run the other way. He stays with us. But he's still, the kings are here to tell us that we're not to be just gimme, gimme, gimme people before the God of the universe. We got to give back to him. And the three things that kings teach us today are the three things we need to give. The first thing is they prostrated themselves and they did him homage. We got to give God honor, homage, and worship. The second thing they did is it took, they took time for God. They left their homeland, they left everything, they put everything on hold just to be in this relationship with God. Everything else was secondary. So the second thing they gave God was their time. The third thing they got, gave God, and they teach us, is they gave God their treasure. So the three things we need to focus on this day of epiphany is to give God homage, to give God time, and to give God our treasures. Huh? Let's focus on the first. To give God homage means that we thank God for who he is, not just for what he does for us. Huh? The best example of that would be Job. The Lord has given, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's homage. That we don't just sit there and thank God when things are going great. But we thank God when things aren't going great because he deserves it. He still gave us existence. He still takes care of us. He's promised us eternal life. He's promised us that we're going to live forever. He's promised to die for our sins. He's promised to take care of us. So no matter what... We, when we praise God, we give him homage, we're making an act of trust that you who are God will take care of me even though the situation doesn't look right. I will praise you, I will honor you, I will glorify you. And when we get to do this, it comes to the book of Revelation, which is in our chapel of adoration, which I talk about all the time, chapter 4 of Revelation. Where that we do, they call out, it says they cry out night and day without pause, they sing. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was, who is, and is to come. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was, who is, and is to come. And every time they cry out, the people fall down, they take their crowns, and they throw it before the throne, and they worship him. So every time we come before God and we do him homage, we get to enter into the kingdom of heaven while we're still on earth. And so that's the key. Instead of being gimme, gimme, then we keep... See, when we're gimme people, we're only focused on earth. And we stay on earth. We're focused about, are my needs being taken care of now? Is everything okay now? And we stay here. But when we start praising God, we leave here and enter into the kingdom. So it's totally up to you where you want to be. Your call. First thing is to give him homage. The second thing is to give him time. 
You know, when we started the Adoration Chapel, however, about three years ago, I guess it is now, and we put the posters together and everybody had their idea about what should be on the poster, you know, like the gentle invitation, please come to Jesus. And I said, no. It's, is God worth your time? Why? Because that's the question. And I said, that really isn't the question. I go, oh, you're so strong about that. Yes, I am. Because it comes down to, God was worth the time of the Magi. God was worth everything else. He put every, they put everything aside. They left their particular countries, and they put everything aside to be with God. How about you and me? Is God worth our time? And a great thing, you know, some people say, oh, Father, you don't get it. I am very busy. Oh, I know. Oh, absolutely, I know. Very, I know. Who do you give more time to, though? God or TV? Hmm? If you're so, so busy, so, so busy, what gets more of your time per week, God or television? And if you have time for television, don't you ever tell me you don't have time for God. Don't you ever say, oh, I'm too busy, because you're not. You just give your priorities a little screwed up. Don't you hate that? <laughs> you just have screwed up priorities, huh? That the reality is, you know, in this church of 850 families, whoa, we have 22 openings in the Adoration Chapel for a week. 22. I almost had a heart attack the other day when Dominic called me. I said, you mean to tell me in our church of 850 families, we can't fill that? We have 22 openings? And again... I don't buy that people can't do it. Of course you can do it. Of course you can give God that hour a week. Because you can do it in the middle of the night. You can do it morning. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. If you can get an hour of TV in a week, I'm sure you can get an hour of adoration. And of course we always can't do it. In two weeks I won't be here, so I sign up and people take my place. So if you can't be there every week, you say you need a substitute and people will help you. But is God worth your time? He's going to mess up your priorities for a moment. You're going to have to leave doing something. Might be sleep. To go to be with him. The Magi left everything to go to be with him. Will you give him your time? Is he worth your time? And not just the time about, well, I go to Mass on Sunday, don't I, Father? A lot of people go to Mass on Sunday for one reason. Not you, but there are people like that. So they don't go to hell. Because if I miss Mass on Sunday, it's a mortal sin. If I die in mortal sin, I go to hell. Then you go to Mass for what reason? For you. Why don't you come and give him an hour a week for him? Hmm. I know you hate for, for more than the yelling, I know. Number three. First of all, we need to give God our homage. The second thing we need to give God is our time. The third thing we need to give God is our treasure. When they came, they didn't come empty-handed to God. And so when we come to God, we cannot come empty-handed. He has given all of us something. And so that's what we come and we give back. And they gave him his time, they gave him treasure, they gave him money, but they also gave them the treasure that they had. Here's my treasure, God. And again, as I've talked about before, our treasure got to be made sure that we bring it before the Father. We take our treasure and we bring it before Jesus. And that's what we have, huh? Our money, our different things, we bring it and we lay it at his feet. And so again, the question is, what do you do with your treasure? Are you a tither? Not so much to the church, but to God. Do you give God your 10% off the top? Is he worth your treasure? Or is the treasure yours? It's my treasure. God gave it to me. I worked for it. It's mine. Great. Keep it. God doesn't need it. But you do if you give it. When you give to God your treasure, he blesses you abundantly. You see, we can never outgive God. That's the point of all the three things we talked about. When we sit there and do this, we always get more. Always. That's the point. We don't do it so we get more. We do it so we can worship him, so we can give him our time, so we can give him our treasure. And God says, listen, when you honor me, I will bless you. It's that simple. When you honor me, I will bless you. So are you blessed in your life? And if you're saying, I'm really not blessed, well, then think about it. Do you give God homage? Do you give him your time? And do you give him your treasure? If you want blessed, 
You got to give them your homage. You got to give them your time. And you got to give them your treasure. And stop thinking you're unworthy to be with him or you're a hypocrite. I'm the biggest hypocrite in this church. Everybody knows it. Huh? Especially after last night. Father's a hypocrite. No, yeah, we're just about like this. Miserable. But we still got to try. We still got to try. We got to get up and try. This day for the three wise men. Is he worth your homage? Is he worth your time? Is he worth your treasure? May you know his love today and forever. Amen. Good morning. Today is Divine Mercy Sunday, as we've talked about. And if we listen to the gospel, some important happens here. We see Jesus who comes upon the apostles and they were all afraid, like so many people are. They live in a life of fear. Fear of tomorrow, fear of what's going to happen, fear of sickness, fear of death, just living in fear. This particular time, the apostles lived in fear, the Jews. And then Jesus appeared in the midst of their fear and he said, peace be with you. And it wasn't enough the words of peace. What got the apostles to start rejoicing is he showed them his hands and his side. So in the midst of our own struggles and our own fears, Jesus comes before us on this Divine Mercy Sunday and he says, peace be with you. And then he shows us his hands in his side. And he says, look it, this is what it costs me to love you. This is what it cost me. I give everything. I was wounded and I died. Just to give you mercy, just to give you love. And that's why, again, if you ever read Sister uh, Faustina, St. Faustina's diary, again and again, the one complaint out of Christ's mouth, again and again, is my people do not believe in my mercy. My people do not receive my mercy. They despair of mercy. You know, last night, it's always good when you're a pastor of a parish and you got keys to everything. And when everybody else is asleep, you can come into the church in the darkness. And so last night and then that night, I came down here. I just sat in front of the, the mercy picture. And it's the original one, or, you know, close to a copy of the original one that, that Sister Faustina saw. And as I just sat there, and you could focus so much on the rays, when he again, when he sees Sister Faustina, he points to his side the same way he pointed to his side when he was with the apostles. And coming forth, these rays of blood and water, this ray of baptism, this ray of mercy, and to just immerse yourself in it. And that's all I did last night, because of course I know, some people don't think I know, how much I am in need of mercy. There isn't a day, nothing, where I don't, and I'm not in need of mercy. When I do missions and I go around, I always say to the people, now, you just know me for these last eight hours. What do you think gets me in trouble more than anything else? And they all, at the same time, it's amazing, point to their tongue. Why would that be? They only meet me for eight hours and they can already tell that reality. And so with all of us, each of us are in need of mercy for one thing or another. And this is what Jesus wants to give you and I this day. He wants you and I to come before him and to receive the mercy. No, you're not worthy. That's what mercy is. You can't sit there and say, oh, I'm not worthy. You don't want to give me the mercy. You know, that self-pity doesn't do squat. It doesn't do squat. It doesn't help you in your spiritual life. It doesn't help you in your family life. It doesn't help you because all it does is it's something that the devil uses to pull you down and make you not an instrument, not an effective minister, instrument, because you focus and I focus on ourselves. That self-pity is not what God wants of us. He wants us to come before him and acknowledge how much we need the mercy. And not just to acknowledge that, but then to receive that. To be bathed in these rays of light and red. To be bathed in there. To sit in the mercy. huh? And when we do this, like the apostles, we will rejoice. We will rejoice because when we're in the presence of God, it's our sins that killed him. 
our sins. But that's fine for him. Look at how much I love you. Look at how much. And what he wants us to do is to be bathed in his mercy. To receive the mercy. To stop making excuses why we're not worthy enough. To just receive it. And the reason he wants us to receive this is the same reason he wanted the apostles. Isn't it amazing? Here they are afraid. They're looking at him and think, oh, we all betrayed you. You're going to be mad now. And he says, peace be with you. Shows him his hand. Shows him his, uh, his side. And then what's he say again? Peace be with you. He said it again. This is what I want you to have. I want you to have peace. That is God's will for you. That is God's will for me. That we have peace. Now we're not talking about peace in the world where there's no war and let's fight against the war and let's stand. That has nothing to do with the peace that Christ is talking about. The peace that Christ wants is peace in your heart. What's peace? By definition, oneness with self, oneness with others, oneness with God, oneness with the world. Peace. It clicks. That's what God wants of you and me. And he not only wants it, he gives it as a gift. And the way we receive this gift is when we dwell in his mercy. But then the reason he wants us to have this gift, we look again in the gospel, and what does he do after he says peace again? He now sits there and says, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. That after we come into the very presence of God and he wants to give us peace and we immerse ourselves in his mercy, we immerse him ourselves in his blood, we feel this inside of our very being, then we rejoice. Then what do we got to do? We got to be the instruments of this mercy. See, so often people want to receive the mercy, but they don't want to give it. <laughs> Because, yeah, okay, I hurt Christ, but boy, this person really hurt me. We can't truly be instruments of mercy unless first we receive it, and then we got to want to give it to everybody. Now, get this. When you and I give mercy, we're going to be doing the same thing Jesus did. Peace be with you. And we're going to show them our hands, and we're going to show them our side. Because just as mercy cost Jesus Christ his life, when you and I give mercy, it'll cost you and I our life. We'll have the wounds to show that we have been mercy givers. We'll have these wounds to show people. That means we forgive people and we give them mercy whether they deserve it or not. That by definition, mercy. That means we give people mercy even when they have not asked for mercy. Huh? Now again, some people play this game and say, well, I'll give it to them if they ask. But what if they don't ask? You still got to give it. Well, where does it say that, G, the Father? Oh. It says it on the cross. Jesus, while the people were crucifying him, spitting on him, not one person there, not one, that was spitting on him, crucifying him, killing him, torturing him, not one asked for mercy. Not one said, I'm sorry, as far as we know. Not one said, oh, forgive me, Jesus. All of them wanted to kill him. All of them wanted him to suffer. All of them wanted him dead. And he looked at all of them and he forgave them. That's mercy. How about us? Are we truly these instruments of mercy? Do we have the wounds that we can show people? These wounds come from me giving mercy to people. That's what we need to be doing. Showing others. These are what the wounds are about. They're not wounds just because, oh yeah, I've stood up for what's right. Ah! They're wounds of mercy. I stood up and I forgave those who hurt me. That's what it is to be an instrument of mercy, or an icon of mercy. And it'll kill us and it'll hurt us. Yes, but we got to gladly want to embrace that. Because when we do... Then we have this peace. Again, as I've talked about it before, when you and I refuse to forgive or different things we've talked about many times, we don't have peace in our heart, and we never will. So again, you can walk out of here, completely dismiss what I say, because Father's a jerk, and walk out and say, he just doesn't understand what it's like to be hurt. 
trust me, be a pastor for a week. I understand. But the reality is, we all got to get beyond it. Not hold the grudges and say, mercy is what God wants me to give you. And to become icons of mercy. When you and I finally can get there, by God's grace, not by ours, then peace starts settling in on us. And just as he gave great life to Christ, so will God the Father give great life to you and me. If we go through the struggle of forgiving, giving mercy, having the wounds of mercy, wanting peace to the giving, wanting to think about that. Here's someone hurt you very badly, they stole from you, they've hurt you, they've hurt your family, and you look at them and you want to give them peace. What do I want for you? Not justice. I want you to have the peace of God in your heart. Whoa. That's what it is to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Yep. It'll cost you your life. Just like it cost him his. But once it does, he'll give us great life. And we will finally have peace. Major Noah's love today and forever. Amen. There we go. Today, the gospel that we hear is the gospel we'll be using in about a month and a week already is Thanksgiving. So we'll be talking about that gospel on Thanksgiving Day. But what I want to focus on is the second reading. And here's Paul in chains giving hope and giving instruction to the early disciples about what it means to follow Jesus. And he says that little saying, he says, this is saying is trustworthy. The old translation used to say, this, you can count on this saying. You can depend on this saying. And so the saying that Jesus, Paul tells us, it says, if we have died with him, then we shall live with him. If we persevere, we shall reign with him. But if we deny him, he will deny us. But if we are unfaithful to him, he will remain faithful because he cannot deny himself. And I love the last line, because I am one through my sins and who has more and more times in my life been unfaithful to him. But he will not be unfaithful to me or to you. But let's go back to the beginning and start. Where it says here, we need to die with Christ. He's telling the, the disciples, listen. It isn't about just ratifying or just doing what you happened when you got baptized, right? Because every one of us, the day we got baptized, you and I died with Christ, correct? Sacramentally. But we got to ratify what happened to us sacramentally as we grow. And then we realize that what this costs me and you to follow Jesus is our lives every day. And how does it cost us our lives every day? By denying our will and saying yes to the will of the Father. By if you don't want to go to Mass, you go to Mass. By if you um, don't want to reach out and forgive somebody, you go reach out and forgive somebody. If you don't want to be kind to somebody, you go and you be kind to somebody. You go against your will to do the will of God every day. So that's what Paul's saying. Listen, if we dine with him every day, then we will rise with him. We need to ratify it. Today, at 2 o'clock, i got to be down in Pittsburgh. That's why we're going to get through this mass fast. Anyway, but as I go down to Pittsburgh, I have to be there at 2 o'clock for be a godfather. It's been years since I've been a godfather, since I'm a priest, huh? And the baby, this little boy Jack is his name. And his father was one of my, in the youth group when I first got ordained. His father now is 37 years old. Forget that. But anyway, so... I'm going to go down and be Jack's godfather. Well, then for the rest of my life, that poor kid, I will be responsible to help get this child to heaven. So what I will do for this little boy for the rest of his life, that poor child, is I will encourage him to die for Jesus every day. To live your life, Jack, every day for Jesus Christ. 
Don't just go to church on Sunday. Don't just try to be a good person to fit God into your life. Your life now, because you got baptized, means you have a daily dying with Jesus Christ. Huh? So that's the first thing we got to do. And then we've got to be people who persevere. I mean, people who persevere means that I keep doing it no matter how it makes me feel, right? I keep doing it. And again, the greatest thing for perseverance in our time is Mother Teresa. And we've talked about Mother Teresa a lot these last months. But here, for 50 years, she felt nothing except for five weeks. But every day she spent an hour or two hours on her knees in the hardwood before the Lord and the Blessed Sacrament. Every day! Every day she'd reach out and take care of the poor. Those who nobody else wanted, she went out and took care of. And she persevered. She didn't say, you know, I'm not getting anything out of this. You know, I keep doing it and 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 doing it for 50 years. But I don't feel anything. I'm not getting out of it. Why am I doing this? I quit. Hey, what she did. What a saint of perseverance. But now, since she had nothing during her lifetime before, from Christ, she felt nothing. Now that's why she's a saint. She persevered, and so does the promise of today, which is worthy and something to be depended on. She will reign with Christ. The same with us. With us. Do you persevere no matter what? Whether you're getting out of it or whether you don't. Whether you can go on, Father, I've been doing this for months and I get nothing. Yeah. I go in adoration and I don't feel anything, Father. You keep going. Father, I keep reaching out and I keep trying to forgive people. They're not responding. Keep doing it. We've got to keep doing it if we're going to reign with Jesus Christ. Got to keep doing it again and again. Now, the next line is a little bit harder. It says, Jesus says... If you deny me, I will deny you. Because what he does is he gives us our own free will. And he says, listen, freely I give my life for you, but if you deny me, then I'll give you what you want. And it's not me. Forever. Right? So if you deny me, I will deny you. So I hopefully, I know, I can sit there and say that I and ever in my life have explicitly denied Christ. I'm guessing most people here have not. But the next line, and if we have denied him, we need to repent, please, God, soon. Because he'll give us what we want. So if we've denied Christ, we've got to repent of that. But the next line is, I think, where most of us are at. If we are unfaithful to him, he will remain faithful to us because he cannot deny himself. When we have died with Christ, as it says in Galatians 2.19, I have been crucified with Christ. So the life I live now is no longer mine. Christ lives inside of me. So when it goes back to dying with Christ, that means that I no longer live. So Jesus lives inside of me. So to deny or to be unfaithful to him, he remains faithful because he can't deny himself. Because when we die to Christ every day, Jesus and me, there's no difference. He lives his life through you and me. So though we struggle, though we are unfaithful, Though we sin, though we fall, every time we get up, he says, of course I love you. Of course I forgive you. I am inside of you. I will never let you go unless you tell me, I want you to leave me go forever. And then he'll obey you when it comes to that. But if we're weak, unfaithful, sinful, he'll never, ever be unfaithful to us. Praise God. May Adrian know his love today and forever. Amen. Let us. Good morning. Today we begin the church year. And as we begin the church year, the gospel, and again, I want you to sit there and make sure you're paying attention. That this is God speaking to us. This isn't a church. This isn't someone's opinion. This isn't what somebody thinks. This is what Christ himself says. He says, you better be ready. Because he's going to come when a time you don't know it. And what he's saying is, is begin with the end in mind. But every day as we begin a church here, it's amazing. We start the church here with this reading about the end. But it's not just the end of when Jesus comes back. You know, two will be standing, one will be taken, and one will not. That means the day you drop dead. That's what it means. 
that you always got to be ready. And what you do when you're ready, if you listen to that second reading, it means you've got to be in a state of grace. To always be in a state of grace. Now, a state of grace means you have no mortal sin on your soul, right? Mortal sin, missing mass on Sunday, getting drunk on purpose, sex outside of marriage, uh, hurting someone, having an abortion, helping someone have an abortion. All those things are objectively mortal sins. If you commit a mortal sin and you drop dead, what happens? They go to hell and not pass, go and not collect $200. Father, I don't believe that. Well, nobody asks you. This is the teaching of God and His church. This is what it means to be a member of the Roman Catholic Church. This is what it means to take God at His word, and when God says something, that we believe it. We don't change it and say, well, I don't agree with that. As we talked about last week, if He's my master, if He's my king, you never argue with your master and king. You only obey and serve. Right? So here's what God tells us. To be in a state of grace. To always desire God's will. And then he tells us in the first reading how to do that. Huh? Did you pay attention? What did that first reading talk about? Come, let us climb the mountain of the Lord, that he may instruct us in his ways, and we may walk in his paths. So what we've got to do is we've got to let Jesus Christ himself, the God of the universe, instruct us. Now this is important. Because I think that most people don't want Christ to instruct them. I think, like when I was did a, learning to preach as a seminarian, when I was preached and I was thrown out of a seminary because of my preaching, it, when the priest looked at me and he says, our job as ministers is just to help tell people that God loves them and everything's going to be okay. I don't buy that at all. And neither is the teaching of the church. Our job is to tell people the truth about revelation, about who God revealed himself to be. And primarily, God is love. Huh? And so because of love, he lets us make our own choices. And he gives us our choices. So if we don't want to be with him, he says, okay, I won't make you be with me. I'm not an ogre. You want to be with me, you obey me. You don't, that's fine. I'll let you do what you want. But that has a consequence. You won't be with me. Is that what you want? And so we look at God and God says, I want to be the one who instructs you. So that means we first of all got to want to be instructed by God. You know, so to be instructed by God means we desire Him and we desire to let Him teach us. Now that means we go to Him to find out how to live our life. Not Oprah, not Dr. Phil, not the newest uh, self-help book. Nobody except for God Himself. And how does God tell us what He wants of us? Primarily. Through the Word of God. What's that? He teaches us how? Through His Word, the Gospel, the Old Testament, the New Testament together. It's in His Word. So if you and I want to sit there and be instructed by God, then we've got to be people committed to daily Bible reading. we just got to be. Huh? When I go around and I do my missions, the first night it's always funny because I always sit there and I always say, okay, let me see your Bibles. Raise your Bibles for me. And everybody starts to laugh. Ha, 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 Because they know we're Catholic, Father. Come on, we didn't bring a Bible to listen to you. And then I always give them homework. Okay, by tomorrow, you're going to bring a Bible. So some of you are going to have to go out and buy one. And it has to be a good Catholic Bible, right? Because we have more books. So I want you to go buy one. And then the next day when I sit there and I start the second night of the mission, I say, let me see your Bibles. And then everybody holds up the Word of God. And I go, whoa, this looks like the Assembly of God. And they all go, whoa. And I say, now listen, it's not just enough to bring a Bible. What do you got to do with it? You got to read it. So I sit there and tell them, no Bible, no breakfast, no Bible, no bed. Okay. And then often as I do this, I'm thinking, huh. I go around all around the United States and I tell people to do this. And people sit there and they email me and say, Father, my life was changed because I start reading the Bible every day. And often I think, huh. Wonder how many of my parishioners at St. Joseph Church, Bread of Life Community, read the Bible every day. 
Now I know, especially at this mass, there's more than other masses. But I still know that at least 50% of you will not pay attention to what I say today at all. You'll sit there and say, that's nice, I don't have to do it, and walk out. I know you will. But the Word of God, as we begin this new time of the year, this is what I want to encourage you to make a spiritual commitment for this new church year. That you will spend five minutes a day for the rest of this church year, which is till next December, reading the Word of God. Now, some of you look at me and they go, Oh, Father, you don't understand. I don't have the time to do that. Come here. Whack! You don't have the time. Of course you have the time. Because the same people would sit there and say, Oh, I don't have the time. I'll bet you have time to read the paper every day. I'll bet. Well, no, I don't read the paper. Okay, you don't read the paper. I'll bet you have time to watch TV. I'll bet. I'll bet you. You have time to do what you want to do. I'll bet. Then why can't you? So that means you're letting the world instruct you. You're letting Oprah instruct you. You're letting everybody else instruct you. You're letting the paper instruct you. Why will you not let Christ himself instruct you through his word? So you decide today that you will for the rest of this year, and hopefully it gets you going so you do it for the rest of your life, that you'll take five minutes a day and spend time reading the Word of God. And again, you don't read it from cover to cover. Okay, Father, I'll take you and I'll start reading the whole Bible from cover to cover. Don't do it. Read it. Spend time with the Holy Spirit. Ask the Spirit of God to reveal to you His Word. Because it's only God's Spirit that can change your heart. If you read the Bible like you read any other book, this is gonna, the only thing that's going to change is your head. And you're going to sit there and say, well, what's that mean? I don't know. And oh, it was an interesting thought. And it's going to be a head experience. And that's not what we want. We want a heart experience. So that the God of the universe, by the power of His Spirit, can go into your heart and change your life. So it's only the Holy Spirit that can happen by. So, if you make a commitment today, okay, for the rest of this year, I will give five minutes a day to reading God's Word. And then you sit there and you pray the Holy Spirit, and then you slowly start reading His Word until God touches you. Then stop, you listen, and respond. i told you this how many times throughout the years? Many. But many of you still have not picked it up yet. Not even begun it. It lets you go in one ear and out the other, and that's nice. Well, let this be the year it changes. It's time to grow up, people, spiritually. It's time to stop making excuses. It's time to sit there and say, well, I don't have... It's time to decide to grow spiritually so that you and I, if he calls you tonight, he calls you tomorrow, he calls you 50 years from now, you'll be ready because you went to him every day. And you let him instruct you on how to live your life. You let him tell you what he wants of you. Not your friends, not the people who think the way you do, not television. Christ himself. And if you let him instruct you, then you'll walk in his way. And then you'll be ready. No matter when he calls you. Because you're walking with him on earth. You want to walk with him forever. The question is simple. Will you commit yourself to reading his word every day? And if the answer is no, how very sad. How very, very sad that he's not worth five minutes of your life every day. So, are you going to do it? Promise? You better. I didn't see some people saying yes, you wimp. I'm telling you, everybody got to do it if you're going to grow. If not, you're going to be the same as you always are, and what's with that? May each of you know his love today and forever. Amen. That was nine minutes and 50 seconds. And that counts for you three too, right? Yes, Father. Yes, Father. What kids you are. Let us stand and let us profess our faith. Good morning. Today, as we said, is the Feast of the Holy Family. As we focus on the Feast of the Holy Family, if you go and you spend time in our Bread of Life Chapel, the Eucharistic Chapel, which I hope everybody's been there. <laughs> Uh, but I know that's not a true thing. If you have not been in our chapel yet, 
don't go home today until you go next door and at least pop your head in there. He's been there for four years. You should have been there at least once. So, if you haven't been there, get over there after Mass. He said gently, kindly, and compassionately. Now, if you ever sit there and go in that chapel and you look at the tabernacle, the tabernacle is the tabernacle of the Holy Family. And it shows the two families of God, if you will. It's one family, but the two representations. The first, you see the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then, under that, you see Joseph, Mary, and Jesus. Joseph and Mary and Jesus between them, Jesus is a boy, and walking with him. And often as I spend time in the chapel, especially in the middle of the night, it's so beautiful to sit there and think, this is the family, and the reason I got that tabernacle was on purpose for the family, for the holy family, to remind us and to give us an example. And I think there's many examples the holy family gives us. And I think the primary example, if you were to sit there and look at the Holy Family's life, the primary example they would give us is they were a family of prayer. Huh? You know that they prayed. Jesus, who is God, is his humanity, would spend the whole night in prayer. So if anything was happening at the Holy Family's house, it was a house and a family of prayer. And so as we take the Holy Family as our example to teach us how to live, the question we have to ask ourselves today on the Feast of the Holy Family is, is your family known as a family of prayer? Is your family known as a family of prayer? Huh? Because that's a bit... If I ask you if your family known as a family of love, you'd say, of course, Father. Is your family known as a family of respect? Of course, Father. Is your family known as a family of prayer? Uh, we pray. We go to church together. That's nice. But you have a prayer time as family. And first, let's begin with the couple. And as a couple, do you pray together as a couple? You know, yesterday I had two weddings. And I do lots of weddings. And I'm usually preparing people, especially the younger people. And we're getting there and they have to go through the three things with me, those poor people. I always sit there and say, when they go through the focus exam, part of the stuff is your spiritual life. Are you comfortable spiritually asking your partner to pray with you? And so I sit there and I ask them, do you pray with each other? And I think in all these 18 years of asking people, I will bet you only 2% have said yes. Two. And it's average 25 a year, about, so 25, so you figure out the things. How many Catholic couples pray with each other? And I say, well, I want you to start. Huh? And I go, oh, dear. You know, Father, you have not a clue what it is. You're a celibate. What the heck do you know about being, don't you ever get that, you know, priests can't do marriage counseling, because what do they know? They don't know squat. Shut up. You know, these people there sit there and, oh, they don't know anything. Shut up. I'm in relationship, too. I have a family, too. Believe it or not, I was with them at Christmas. And we prayed together. <gasps> Priests don't just come out of boxes. We sit there and we come from a family. So I have something to say about a family. And so the first thing I, and I always think it's so sad that I as a priest am more intimate a lot of times with wives and husbands than they are with each other. Why? Because I see their soul. And they'll share that with me because I'm the priest. And I'll say, do you ever share your soul with your spouse? Oh, no, no, Father. You know, I think religion is a private thing. And what are your other sins? Religion is not a private thing. Absolutely not. Or if it was a private thing, you're wasting your time here today because this is not a private experience. Religion is a personal thing, but religion means nothing. It's about relationship. Huh? It's a relationship, and there's no private relationships. All relationships are public. So let's go back. Do you pray with your spouse? And if you do not... Well, you know what happens on Tuesday. What it was Tuesday? It's New Year's. I'll give you something to do for New Year's. Instead of, I'm going to lose 30 pounds this year. Why don't you sit there and grow in your spiritual life? By beginning to pray with your spouse if you don't already pray with your spouse. Now, some of you say, Father, you know, uh, I'm not very comfortable with this kind of stuff. And your point? 
Like I'm supposed to sit there and say, oh, well, if you're not comfortable, that's okay, yeah. It's time to grow. It's time to get stretched. It's time to sit there and be a man or be a woman and say, as a family, beginning with each other, we need to start praying with each other. So you can sit there and see the mystery. You know, some people, as that people come in and they've been married for a while, they get bored with each other. If a couple is bored with each other, I will tell you, first and foremost, they do not pray with each other. Because now, if they, don't, if they pray with each other, life is always a mystery. Because when you see a soul, a soul is infinite. It's eternal. There's always more. You will never get to know yourself or ever get to know another fully if you look into their soul. So when you share your soul with each other, you see mystery always. You can never be bored. But if you just re reduce yourself to your time together, and, oh, I know their personality, you know, we've been together forever, I know all about them, you have reduced your marriage to nothingness. It's much deeper. There's always a mystery. And so how to spark that spark? Pray. And a good way to do it at first, because if you're not comfortable with this, hold hands and say, Our Father, it's not my Father, it's our Father. Before you go to bed tonight, every night you and your spouse get together, come on, say, Our Father. Oh, that'd be so hard. Shut up. It would not be so hard. It's a priority. Of course you could do that. And then as you grow, you sit there and you learn, you who are men, to pray with your wife. Lord God of the universe, you are present here, and I ask you to bless my wife, to embrace my wife, to help her to know I'm here for her, to help her to know that you're always there for her, to help her to know that it's okay, and I'll appreciate everything she does for me and the children. And then your wife sits there and goes to the husband, listen, I want you to go, Father God of the universe, I ask you to bless my husband. He works so hard. He tries his best. Help him and strengthen him so he can be the father of this family. And you start doing that with each other. You have that spiritual bond. Because until you have a spiritual bond, there's always loneliness. I promise. So you have that spiritual bond as a couple. On my marital tape, on my uh, tape on marriage, on my tape on the truth, and when I'm doing counseling to uh, uh, preparing a couple for marriage, I say, what I want you to do is I want you to pray before you have physical intimacy. That's the, what we'll call it here at this Mass. You can fill in the blank what that means for the children, huh? But that physical intimacy. Before you have physical intimacy, I would like you to pray with each other. And again, dismissing the priest, he's a celibate. Boy, and the one guy was at least honest with me and said, Oh, Father, that would kill the moment, don't you think? I Quack! Hey, kill the moment. If you think it'd kill the moment, you don't know what physical intimacy is, and you don't know what prayer is. It'll make it more intense. Well, that's nice for a celibate to say, Father. I had a guy listen to my truth tape, and he heard me talk about this. I say it a little bit more explicit on a truth tape, Spruce CD, and he thought, boy, Father's not married, you can tell. And then he thought, so, you know, it was him and his wife listening to it together, and they sat there, and he looked at her and he says, do you want to try it? And they tried it. Could you imagine? It didn't kill the moment. He called me on the telephone. He's from Cleveland. Never met the man before, maybe once. He called me on the phone. He goes, Father, that was the greatest intimacy we ever had. Well, thank you for sharing. But the reality is, here they are. And if you haven't, you've got to try it. If you haven't tried it, ugh, instead of dismissing Father, say, okay, we'll try it once. Once and see what happens. If you get intimately, spiritually first, physical intimacy is more intense, I've heard. So, that reality. The second thing you got to do is you got to pray with each other as a family. Do you have daily prayer time as a family? Again, you can do it as simple as saying uh, uh, an Our Father together. Some people say a rosary together. Remember my, Father Payton from years ago? Father Payton used to say the family that prays together, stays together. And again, when you do that, do not make it such a burden for your children, or they will learn to hate God. You will come here, we're going to say the rosary, and you're going to like it. And then as soon as they're 18, they are going to say, Mom and Dad, we're nuts. We're never going to do that stuff again. You've got to make an experience of love when they're before the God of the universe. The God of the universe wants intimacy with us. Intimacy means 
into me see. Then we come before the God of the universe in prayer. We need to look into the beauty of God. And God looks into us. And that's why we pray with each other. The God of the universe lets us see into each other intimately. Intimately. So you can either say a rosary together. You can sit there and read a passage of the Bible. And then talk about it. You can sit there and... Uh, do something like they had those family uh, reflections, the reflections. There's a lot on the internet for that. And you come together five minutes a day. And if you want it to be a great experience, don't just pray. But that's what we do. We pray. Kneel down, say the rosary. Ah. And they do it and they go, okay, can I leave now? Well, that was the longest 20 minutes of my life. Or after you do that, then you practice intimacy. You make real what's happening between you and God with you and your family. So after you're done praying with each other, you go to each of your children, you go to your spouse, and you look at them together and say, how are you? And you listen to each member of the family every day. You listen to each other. You find out how they're doing inside. It takes five, ten minutes. If you have bigger families, oh, it might take twenty. But you'll never regret that. If you really sit there and you're praying to God, the intimacy with God, and then you're praying as a family, and then you're being intimate with each other by asking each other every day after prayer, how you doing? Are you okay? What's going on inside? And if you just put that, it's a ritual. Huh? All rituals can bring us together if they're good rituals. That's what makes us family. What makes us a family here? The ritual of the Mass. We do it every week. We come together, this is what we do. Have a ritual of prayer in your family. And then we just don't celebrate the Holy Family here in a tabernacle 2,000 years ago. We celebrate the Holy Families of St. Joseph Church, Bread of Life Community, of all the people that listen to us. We celebrate the Holy Families because of the example of the Holy Family. Got it? Get it? Now I want to know, are you going to do it? Yeah, and happy you said, listen to the priest. At least try it. If you don't try it, you're being disobedient. Just a thought. May each of you know his love today and forever. Amen.